So today we're reading Luke 24, 1 through 32. Praise the Lord. <laughs> He's so good. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from, their, from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with whom they, with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to, the, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had, at, had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And they approached the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. Well, does God ever surprise you? You know, you think... Life is going one direction, you've got your plans all laid, and then something else happens, and, and everything goes kablooey, and, and it's like, well, things hopefully turn out for the best, and, and things, but I often wonder, you know, we've been these last few weeks trying to get into the minds of the disciples a little bit, and, and understand a little bit about what they were feeling and thinking uh, during these, these days and time, and, and uh, I don't know what their expectations were as they have walked with Jesus, why they even went to him in the first place and sought him out to um, become his followers. I, I 
imagine that they had heard rumors about him or so, about his miracles or hearing some of his teachings and things, but they were drawn to him. But eventually, you know, it's like somehow they came to know and to believe, even as it says here, these ones that were on the road to Emmaus, it says, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And so they, they believed that this Jesus was the one that all of Jerusalem, all of the Jewish people had been waiting for, all of Israel was waiting for. I mean, for hundreds of years, they've been sort of under, a, been an oppressed people, but they always had that promise that God himself was going to come and God would send one who would, who would restore the, the nation, who would restore that kingdom. And would, a descendant of David would sit upon the throne and rule over them. And so they were looking forward for this. I, I, antis- I suspect that maybe there was more, something in the air when Jesus was, was coming and, and when that time came for him to arrive. There, maybe they felt something, some more excitement in the air or something, but they sought him out. They went and found Jesus, and remember at one point, Jesus had asked his disciples, he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter had replied, you are the, the, the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So they had come to believe that, and they're thinking that this one, their understanding is, oh boy, now he's the one who's going to restore Israel, he's the one. We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You know, we, we give the disciples a lot of grief for some of their, their challenges and the things that it seems like they, they get a lot of things wrong or fuss at them about their lack of faith at different times. But really, you know, let's think about it. They really were ones, they gave their whole lives to the Lord. They had walked away from everything that they knew. They walked away from their jobs and livelihoods and walked away from families in order to follow this one. They really believed that he is the one who's going to turn everything upside down and set them free from the oppression of Rome. And yet, they listen to his teachings, and he's not talking about, you know, well, about military strategy. He didn't say, okay, how are we going to, we're going to gather an army, or how are we going to obtain the right weapons, and this and that. He's talking about, he's talking about love. He's talking about peace. He's talking about serving your neighbors. He's talking about, um, Loving even your enemies. You know, that doesn't sound very much like a revolutionary, except a a completely different kind. But yet I wonder, as they were traveling to Jerusalem, just last Sunday we we celebrated that Sunday that we commemorate as Palm Sunday, when Jesus came riding into town on the donkey, which was a declaration to everybody that he was the one that the prophets had, had foretold, and so they're like, this is it. This is the start of this uprising. This is the beginning. Now we're finally going to go, and the revolution is going to start, and Jesus is going to declare himself king, and the battle's going to begin. And they had to have realized, I mean, when you talk revolution, that's dangerous stuff. People get killed. But they also had said, but let us go with him. We're all, if we die with him, let's go. We're going. So there was a certain a bravery there and an intention. Yes, they're going to give their lives to set Israel free. But how did it turn out? You know, things didn't go so well that week. They're still not seeing. I mean, the only ones Jesus kind of fussed at, they, we think you know, as he comes into Jerusalem, he overturns the tables in the temple. He went to the temple and he's telling them, chasing out the money changers and all this. Um, so he's, he's not going after the political establishment. He's going after the, the, the religious ones. They say, what's up with this? And by the end of the week, you know, he gathers together on, with his disciples on Thursday night, and they're like hearing him talk, and it sounds like he's saying goodbye, like he's preparing them that he's going away. Later that night, he's arrested and hauled off, and they watch him being crucified, put to death as a, as a criminal. So I don't know what it was they were expecting. They were expecting some kind of a different revolution than what they got. They were expecting one who was going to set them free from Israel. And yet, there on that cross, they watched Jesus die. He died. And so did their hopes. So did all their plans and their dreams, their expectations they had to change somehow. So it's hard to imagine the 
the sorrow, the, the disappointment, the dishevelment. They're, they've got to be feeling, what do we do now? We, they've given their whole lives to follow this one and thinking he's the one. This is the one who's going to save us. And he's dead. The women that morning, when they go to the tomb, you know, what are they expecting to see? Obviously, they, wanted, they expected to find the dead body. Remember that Jesus had died late kind of thir- uh, Friday afternoon, probably about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And by the time they got permission to take his body down and all, um, Sabbath was starting. Sabbath starts at the, at the sundown on Friday night. So they didn't have time to properly tend to Jesus' body. They had to quickly put some spices and wrap a cloth around him and toss him in the, into the tomb. But very early on that morning, very early after the Sabbath is done, the women go because, you know, they, this is their act of love. Isn't that what we do? You know, when someone we love has died, we think that, you know, the, the last kindness that we can do for them is to tend properly to their body and see that they're properly laid to rest. And so we do that. And the women were wanting to go because they loved him and, and ho- heading to the tomb ready to, to do that work and probably, you know, let's get her done early because, you know, it's been a while. They've had to wait for the Sabbath to pass, so it's been some hours. And they think, let's get her done before, you know, decomposition really sets in. But they get there, of course, and we know the story. They find that the stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty. Clearly, their first thought is not, hallelujah, he is risen. It, it's like, what the heck, where did he go? Who took the body? How did he, how did he run off? How, how did he, where's he, where'd he go? And they go running back, you know, find the, some of the apostles, you know, the, the different gospel writers recorded a little differently, and so we're not sure, you know, how many women were there, what did they do first and all, but, but uh, Peter and at least one of the other disciples, probably John, also went to the tomb, and they looked in, and nobody really knew what to make of this until it says that the Lord appeared Jesus himself I think that's in some of the other gospel writers they say that Jesus himself appeared to the women and so they could understand they went and told the men but the men were like yeah that that can't be but Jesus had appeared later in the same day two of them are walking to Emmaus and these two are not part of the 12 of Jesus' disciples These two, it says, well, one of them was named Cleopas, and the other one, uh, we don't know that person's name or even gender, but they're walking along, and Jesus comes along and and walks with them, but they don't recognize him. And and it's like, well, why? Didn't they, did he look so different? Or it's like, probably because he was the last person they expected to see walking along. I mean, he was dead for crying out loud. He's not going to come walking alongside them on the road, but he did. And it was when they extended him hospitality, invited him in, he broke bread exactly the same way he had done at the Last Supper on Thursday night, and they recognized him. They, as soon as it says their eyes were open, they recognized the Lord. I imagine at that point they probably turned to really take a good look, and he was gone. He had vanished from their sight. In joy, they hurried back, even though you know, it says it was like seven miles distance it's now after supper so it's probably dark they hurried back to Jerusalem and again the different accounts that say you know some he said well that they didn't believe him but here in Luke it says well he's appeared to Simon so as soon as the people as Jesus had appeared to folks then they understand and they believe you know I think for all of us it's important for us to know that These first disciples, even though they had walked with Jesus, they had heard him say that this is what's going to happen. They hadn't understood, because how can you? Yeah, this has never happened before. How do you understand resurrection? They probably thought, you know, like even as Martha had said when Lazarus had died, and Jesus said, well, he's going to rise again. She said, yeah, yeah, in the end of time, we know that to be true. And that's probably what they were thinking for Jesus. Yeah, he's going to rise again at the end when the resurrection happens. But here, when they had that encounter, for us, now 2,000 years away, we need to know that they had solid evidence, that they believed, not because they'd heard this or the women had come back and said, yeah, the tomb's empty, not because they saw an empty tomb. We know that they 
what they tell us, the story that they tell us is true. The resurrection is one of the well best attested facts in history that Jesus was there because he appeared to them. They saw him, they touched him, and he walked with them. He had then the next 40 days or so to appear to them over times and, and to talk with them and teach them and show them what the scriptures said. So it's important for us to know that it was at rest on solid evidence. They were not going to tell that he is risen unless they knew it as an absolute fact. But their expectations at this point, it's like, okay, Jesus came. They thought he was the one who's going to throw everything over and, and, and set them free. They thought it was a political uprising, but in fact, it was it's spiritual. Jesus had a different agenda. Jesus has a different idea, and so we've got to change those expectations. Now, I wonder, I think there are a lot of folks, even today, who still miss the Lord when he, he comes to visit and they don't recognize him or they don't understand. Even as the ones on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him at first. Because I truly believe, I think the Lord, because the Lord loves every person, right? The Lord wants everybody to be saved, everybody to come into his kingdom. And so I think that the Lord makes himself real to every person in some way or another. But sometimes we just don't recognize because we're, we're looking for something else where our expectations are wrong. We're expecting something, I don't know, maybe you think um, we don't recognize him because we, we have a wrong belief about who God is. You know, um, even Christians, I think sometimes we can, we can think something wrong. We think that we know it all. We, you know, hey, we're in the church. We've got all the answers because they're right here in the Bible. Um, we know God because the Bible tells us so, and Jesus showed us um, who the Father is. But yet sometimes I think we, we don't realize that sometimes our beliefs, how much our own beliefs are, are guided by our own culture. You know, our understanding of who God is here in the Western world, in the United States, might be different than people understand God in Africa or Asia or different places and such. People don't understand, they, they don't recognize the Lord because they're looking for the wrong things. Maybe they're looking in the wrong place, you know, the angel said to the women, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the one who's alive here among the dead? You know, how many people today are looking in dead religion or dead places here and there in all the wrong spots, trying to fill up that need for God in all those wrong places? But when we have that encounter with the Lord, when he opens our eyes, we understand you know, Jesus appears, he shows himself, he, he makes himself real to each one of us. And we can open our hearts and receive and understand and see what he's telling to us. So Jesus, you know, they thought that Jesus was coming to bring a revolution. And indeed he was. He's turned this whole world upside down. The kingdom of God is not at all like the kingdom that we have here on this earth. And so our weapons, he, he has those weapons, they're not weapons of war. We don't take a sword and a spear and all these things. Our weapons are weapons of love and peace and faith. This world is already filled with hatred and violence. It doesn't need any more from us. We've been called to share the love of Christ. God gave his only son because he loved the world. So he gives to us that love. It is a revolutionary thing. If we think that this is what the world's going to happily receive, that, that it's easy for us to, to show the love, it's not. It's revolutionary. You know, God has come. I believe that there's something happening even now in our world as God is revealing himself in fresh ways to us, once again trying to get our attention, say, Christians, listen up, this is who I am. Come, drink from the water, receive the Spirit, fill up, let your hearts be so filled with love that it overflows to everyone, the most powerful weapon we have, love and prayer and faith. Let us share that this morning. Jesus is risen, he is alive, we need not look among the dead to find the Lord. For he is alive. And he is in our hearts.
we are part of a revolution. Let's turn this world upside down where love wins the day because it ultimately does in Jesus' world. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have given to us a love that is unbeatable. Lord, we often, we continue to think that the way to go is to fight for what we need, what we want. But you have shown us that there is a better way. The way of the cross, the way of submission, the way of humility, the way of love. Lord, help us walk in your way. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we go to our prayer time this morning,